Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second floor. My name is Nicholas, and I help direct the events here at The Strand. For a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by, the Bass, by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, uh, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, The Strand is not only surviving in, in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books and now hosts nearly 400 events a year, of which this is one. In large part, this is all thanks to you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we would not be here today. Tonight, I'm excited to have with us Laura McCowan to discuss her brand new book, We Are the Luckiest, The Surprising Magic of a Sober Life. She is a former public relations executive who now leads sold-out yoga-based retreats and apparently book launches as well, <laughs> and courses that teach people how to say yes to a bigger life. She hosted the massively popular podcast, Home, and has been featured on The Today Show, in The Guardian, WebMD, New York Post, and many more. Joining her to discuss her work is Alyssa Altman, author of the books Motherland, Traif, and Poor Man's Feast, as well as the James Beard award-winning blog of the same name. She's also uh, been a finalist for the Frank McCourt Memoir Prize, and her work has appeared in O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, The New York Times, and elsewhere. So please join me in welcoming them to The Strand. trying to scan for faces. <laughs> um, hello, New York. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are we feeling tonight? Good. <laughs> Lucky. Lucky. That's yes. good. I like that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a reading. Surprise. Uh, and a little backstory about this, because I'm not going to read the whole chapter. So about two years ago, I was dating a man. And he relayed this conversation to me. He said, I ran into a friend today. And um, they asked me if I was dating someone. And I said, yes. And the person said, well, I heard that she's a raging alcoholic who lost custody of her daughter and cheated on her husband. So you might want to be careful of the company that you keep. First of all, never date a man who will, or a person who will relay that information to you. <laughs> <laughs> not kind. Uh, we're not together. Um, but you can imagine that that was like, woof, okay. Uh, the exact words were root, the, the person said, word is at the rumor mill. She is those things. So I was, of course, angry at first. Um, and I, <laughs> I'm just gonna read. That's the, that's the preamble. Okay. So this is from a chapter called, We Are All Magnificent Monsters. <clears throat> Sorry. The reason I'm sharing this story with you is not because I want you to know what assholes people can be, but because I want you to see that most of the time, other people's perceptions of you have nothing to do with you. Yes, I wanted to judge the hell out of those people, and I nursed more than one fantasy about approaching them in the midst of one of their rumor mill parties and going all pretty woman on them. Big mistake, big, huge. 
but it didn't take too long for me to find a long line of evidence of the same behavior in myself. The truth is, this is just what we do. It's what humans do when we feel small, which is often. We judge and we minimize and we assume and we talk about other people because it's the cheapest form of social currency and connection and it, because it's a hell of a lot easier than looking at ourselves. Also, there was some truth to it. It wasn't a story pulled out of thin air. But even in my darkest days, when I was still drinking and acting like a complete jerk, that story wasn't the whole one. It certainly wasn't the truest one. The truest story, the one that will always be truest, is that I am a human being being human. Sometimes I am my best self, and sometimes not so much. But goddamn, I am trying to do better. I am always trying to do better. And my guess is that you are too. Of course, I wouldn't have always had this perspective. At one time, hearing something like this would have leveled me completely. I would have spiraled, hidden myself away, and done anything to unhear those words. I had worked my entire life to try and shape your opinion of me and to avoid, at any and all costs, criticism and judgment far less than what I'd heard that day. Why? Because I was ashamed. Ashamed of my body. Ashamed of my feelings. Ashamed of my desire to be loved. Ashamed of my attempts to get it. I was ashamed long before I had any reason to be. And then, eventually, I had reasons to be. I was ashamed of my drinking. I was ashamed of all the places it brought me. I was ashamed of who I'd become in my marriage. I was ashamed of who I was as a mother. I was ashamed of who I was as a friend. I was ashamed. Until a few years ago, I would have had no defense against those words from the rumor mill. But when I heard them that day, I did. On that day, I had already looked every one of my worst nightmares straight in the face. I had already turned over every shameful part of me like rocks on a muddy beach, and I had decided, instead of casting them, casting them back into the sea or smashing them or trying to bury them out of existence, I would treat them as if they were holy. I would treat every part of me that way. I had looked at each mistake and ugly part of my past up close, examined every crack and mineral and texture, and then held it in my palms, washed it clean, kissed it, and set it back down. I did this because I realized there was no amount of self-denigration or punishment that would keep those rocks from coming back to the shore anyway. So rather than try to banish half of me or more, I decided to invite it all in. I decided to make a home for myself, inside myself, in the dirty, cracked mess of me. I decided to love it all. You may be nodding because you're already there and you get it, or else you may be wondering how, how exactly do you get there? You cannot imagine looking at your past or all of yourself without flinching, let alone finding a way to love it. You can't imagine being free of the shame and guilt and regret. Many of the answers as to how I've already talked about, pushing off from here, treating yourself with the same care and priority as you would a growing life, taking steps to tell the truth, if only at first by listening to other people tell theirs, sitting with yourself through a moment of anger or jealousy or grief and just observing as best as you can as a compassionate witness. Believing, if only because I'm telling you to, that there are thousands of other hearts out there who have ached in the exact same way and they found a way to wholeness one breath at a time. Believe me when I tell you that you will not be left out of the miracle if you keep going. But there's another piece, and I really, really want you to hear this. You are a human, not an addict or an alcoholic or any of the worst things you've ever done. 
Addiction is just an experience, one of many that can shape a life. It's not unique. It's not a flaw. It's not even that interesting. It's a natural human instinct to soothe, to connect, to experience ourselves differently gone awry. It's one of the fundamental aspects of our nature, written into every religious and anthropological record from the beginning of time. The only thing it says about you or me is that we are a human, just like all the other humans who have ever existed. That's it. But, you say, that's not how other people see it. And you're right. People largely misunderstand addiction. And some people, no matter what you say or do or how loudly or for how long, will never really get it. As I've illustrated, there will always be people at the rumor mill slinging stories. So you could spend all your time, your precious time, trying to fight that fact, or you could see that none of it has anything to do with you, and instead try to keep building a life you really want to live. You could write a story you really fucking love. Now obviously not everyone experiences addiction to the degree that I did, or that perhaps you did, or still are. My thing happened to be alcohol. I don't know why. I don't even care why. It just is, or it was, the thing that broke me. And thank God for that, because I see it now as my personal invitation. This weird, curious condition where ingesting a liquid substance, you really have to think about it like that sometimes because it's just so odd, has profound physical, psychological, and spiritual effects on me to the point that I organized my entire life around it and nearly allowed it to kill me. Really, it's just so weird, but also a total gift. It was my opening. It led me straight to everything I had always wanted but never knew how to get, and it had to break me. There is no other way. There is no other way for any of us. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote in his poem, The Holy Longing, and so long as you haven't experienced this, to die and so to grow. You are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. Before I went through all this, I was only a troubled guest. I was caught up with trying to be good or else hating the ways in which I was bad. And I saw only those things in others too, good, bad, right, wrong. It was a painful, shallow existence. It was Groundhog Day at the rumor mill. These days, I honestly don't sit around wondering if people are good or bad. I already know they are both. I can't say I'm perfect or perfectly without judgment, but I'm telling you the truth when I say there is so much more space for compassion inside me, for other people, and often, though not as easily, for myself. And in that space, good things have grown, interesting, layered things. I remember sitting in meetings very early on, hearing people share and knowing for the first time in my life, not reading about or listening to or thinking about, but actually knowing what it was like to suffer. I thought, these people are actual heroes. So much of what I'd perceived to be courageous or successful or important or interesting had been such a joke up until then. I hadn't known anything about life at all, what it meant to meet your limitations, or the depths of your capacity for pain, or how hard it was to actually change. I had judged people, I had laughed at their weaknesses, I had thought myself better in a thousand ways, immune to the circumstances, circumstances and situations that create the realities we live in. But those early meetings and the daily struggle of that first year or so stripped away most of my illusions. It was like being introduced to an underworld, a much deeper layer of the human experience, and it didn't take me long to see that it was the place I'd always been chasing. It just looked a hell of a lot different than I thought it would, and the price I had to pay to get there was far more than I expected. In this world, my mistakes are as sacred as my triumphs. 
In this world, the ugly and dazzling are the same. In this world, there is room for both joy and terror, pleasure and pain. In this world, nothing is too shameful to speak of. Nothing counts you out. In this world, I am already and always forgiven, and so are you. We are all magnificent monsters, capable of everything, all the light and every bit of the dark. Only some of us know this. We get to walk as humble guests, not troubled ones, with our feet in the mud and our hearts stretched towards the sky, part earth, part heaven. We don't fear hell because we've already been there. So our only promise is to keep going, to try to do a little bit better in this moment than we did in the last. And we know that is enough. Just glorious. Um, thank you for letting me sit here next to you. Um, and thank you thank all. You. Um, um, the Strand is one of my favorite bookstores in the world, so um, it's an honor for me to be here and be sitting alongside of, of Laura. Um, just a short background. Um, I first discovered Laura's um, remarkable work, like many of you did, um, hearing her voice on internationally known podcasts and reading her award-winning blog on the vagaries of recovery and the stuff that other people were simply not talking about. Um, when I first read uh, We Are the Luckiest as a Galley, I knew that it was gonna have the kind of impact on its readers that the late Caroline Knapp's Drinking a Love Story had so many years ago. And that is a book that I read and read and read every year. Laura, though, is a singular, singularly stunning writer. And her book, and I have been saying this since I first read it in, in uh, galley form, is a, is a gift for everyone um, at every stage of their journey. Um, and it is filled with grace and humility and inclusivity. And I think it will, as Glennon Doyle said, will save lives. Um, and I'm honored to be, to be sitting next to you tonight. Um, so, I, you know, I've re I have read over the years a, a lot of um, recovery memoirs. I think many of us have. And the, one of the things that really stood out about this book is an almost um, crystalline um, honesty and humility about your experience. Um, and as a, I, I, um, apart from being a, a writer, I, I also teach memoir, and I'm always very interested in process and how memoirists um, peel back the, you know, I, I have a history as a food writer, peel the onion and, and get to the core of, of the story. And can you talk a little bit about the process of writing with the kind of emotional clarity that you did and how you were able to access those places that are so hard for many writers to reach. Sure. Um, thank you for your wonderful words. You can compare me to Carolyn Knapp any day, all day, <laughs> and I <will>. forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so by the time I had written this book, I had been talking about my story every week for like three years and going to meetings and talking multiple times a week for years and writing for years about this thing. So I wasn't, um, I, have, I was practiced at my story. Um, and I think that's one of the, the um, gifts, it's a gift of recovery uh, if you if you engage in that process is to be able to straighten out your story and understand what the hell happened, right? Um, because it's not what you think happened, usually. Um, 
you're not just a piece of shit. You know, there's a whole thing going on. So, um, and in doing that, in, in talking and writing for that many years, I also, I don't feel shame anymore about even, if I go there, really go there, I can get into that place, but I don't feel shame about anything that happened because I have talked so much and shared so much and um, digested my story. Um, now, writing it in a book form was very different. As you know, um, it takes a lot of digging to get to what is actually the truth. And um, and this is only my first book, but I but I have this sense when I write anything um, that you I think Elizabeth Gilbert says her her favorite place to be is writing because it's where she's the least full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and um and I think that just comes from because when you're writing and you are full of shit, you can feel it. Right. It doesn't feel good. It feels like, oh, I'm performing right now. Um and I don't like to read performance. You know, I don't those books aren't great. Um, and one of the great things about... And you, you know them when you see them. You, you know, know them, them when, when you read them. them. Yeah. yeah, you feel it. You go, no, <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> um, even if they're, you know, they're exposing this, the trauma and all that, it's like it's much deeper than that. So I don't know if that's really an answer, but I think so much of it had to do with having talked about um, and, and really written versions of this book for years. So, and I didn't write anything in in the book that I didn't have some kind of clarity on. You know, I think the part about relationships is maybe the most uh, open-ended and raw still happening part. Would, was there anything that surprised you that came out through the writing process that you were not necessarily expecting? Yeah. Um, it was, writing this was like going through 10 years of therapy. It was harder than I, th it was so much harder to write through it than I thought. It was like re-experiencing that all over again. And so that itself was surprising. Um, but things that came out, um, I went through as I was writing this th and writing the chapter about um, truth, about the, um, which talks a lot about my relationship with my ex-husband. That's sort of what because I had, we had separated when I was still drinking and I had gone through the divorce when I was newly sober and just trying to survive, I hadn't really processed what happened and, our, and the grief around that marriage ending. So that came up. A lot of, I got a lot of answers in writing about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm always really curious about that because, you know, when I, what I've found as a memoirist is when you're, you know, you're writing and writing and writing and then you step away and you kind of have a moment of oh wait a minute I had no idea why didn't anyone tell me you know um and it's and it's very hard to get to that place um un, until you're in a place of excavation and m writing memoir is nothing uh less than excavation um and sometimes like um dental work without benefit of Novocaine but, right um, yes, there were lots of days of um, heavy blanket wearing <laughs> just after writing like, oh God, this is a full body experience. It is, yeah. it is. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've, been, I've been reading your work for so many, you know, for so many years. And I, I actually have a Laura file on my desk. Um, and I, and I've, I, it, it's a, it's, Printouts from you know from from the blog and and I always keep um, keep that file close in hand and I've actually traveled with it um, and um, and it actually the 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 shame cave is one of is one of the pieces that I that I read and reread and especially now reading an awful lot um, at what point I'm curious but as a former blogger myself um, at what point did you you know that you were going to make the transition um, to the to the page, and and what was your book process like? I'm I'm curious about that. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't really. Uh, I always wanted to write a book. That was always the end and not the end game, but that was like 
the thing that I, I wanted to happen and that I knew I was working towards. Um, I, so I, and I knew really early on in trying, before I was even sober, that this is what I wanted to write about because I just felt like this, I had so much to say and figure out. So the book was always there uh, as an idea. Um, I didn't, there wasn't like a moment in time where I'm like, okay, now I'm transitioning to, to writing a book. But funnily, en funnily, well, laughably enough, I thought that, oh, this will just be like writing lots of blog posts. Oh, it's not. It's not. <laughs> that was really cute. I was like, oh, I've already done this. I just will write a bunch of blog posts. No, not no, so much. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I started, uh, I started to write a book. I have old um, files of, it was named something else before in st that started in 2014. So when I was like five minutes sober, <laughs> I couldn't have written it, it then. And the, the writing from that, that those files is, is terrible. But um, I realized I think around 2016, 17, that I wanted to write a book about sobriety, less about the the drag out story of my drinking and more about what it was like to get sober because that to me was so interesting and not talked about all that much. You know, usually it goes, there's all the drinking craziness and then they get sober, which I love those books and I read them all, but I wanted to go, what happens afterwards? So, um, but I had to experience some of that first. Um, and then the process was for me, I, um, I many times did note cards, index cards of like the lessons that I wanted, like the like sort of the nuggets that I wanted to communicate to people or that I needed to know. I would always think of like, okay, Laura in 2012, laying in the, her bed, just hung over all the time and terrified that she had to get sober. What did she need to know? And ultimately that's how I structured the book. It wasn't um, because Although this is a memoir, there are some prescriptive elements to it. And I, um, t I knew, I, I, for a while, I was like, I'll write a self-help book, and then I'll write a memoir, and then I'll write a self-help. And I was like, I, I want to do memoir, but have also a little bit of this teaching voice. And so that was an OK way to structure it. I don't right. know that that would work with memoir otherwise. I don't know. But um, yeah, so I laid out, these are the things I want to know. I want to talk about shame. I want to talk about telling the truth. I want to talk about dating i want to talk about being a mother and and structured it like that yeah it's 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 the interesting thing about it um from a narrative point of view is that um it's um it's sort of seamlessly constructed um and um as you know as a as a former editor i mean i can say it's it's a complicated thing to do you know and we we look at um in when i when i my former life in publishing um, we would say well, it's a prescriptive memoir, or it's a memoir memoir, or it's yeah. a you know, and it's neither fish nor fowl, or what. And what uh, what really struck me um, about about this book is that um, you 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 tell your story, and in your story um, are are, the, are the, the the lessons. I don't want to say lessons, but the right. lessons and. Um, and, and I see this book as being the kind of book that um, I've gone through two copies already. Um, one copy has fallen apart, um, and I'm not just saying that. Um, Did and you drop I, it in the bath or something? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> the dog the, eat it? Crack the spine. The puppy didn't eat it, no. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the, it's the kind of book that I can see um, existing on the shelf um, and the kind of book that one dips into at any point in the book, um, at any place in the book, after, you know, a, a, a read from beginning to, to end. And, you know, that br br actually brings me to, to my next question. Um, the, one of the things that really struck me about it, um, bearing in mind that there are lessons in it and there is takeaway, um, is its absolute lyricism. And um, one of the things that really um, uh, attracted me to your writing early on, long before I ever talked to you or reached out to you, um, 
uh, was your love, your obvious love of poetry. Um, and we just we had a we had a small Marie Howe moment um, before we came before we came in here. Um, and Rumi and you know um, and 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 Mary Oliver and and um, and and there is a poetic quality to your writing on uh, what is an incredibly difficult, deeply personal subject that enable that allows it to transcend the genre. Um, and and you you talk early on about and this is a direct quote from from the book addiction is a learned behavior born of the natural human impulse to soothe to connect to love to feel good and this sentence alone does so much to undo the stereotype and the confusion that our culture has foisted upon us over the years um, can you can you speak a little bit about um, marrying narrative style to subject? I mean, that's kind of a clunky question. That's all right. I think I get you. Um, thank you, first sure. of all. Yeah. That is a huge compliment to me. Um, well, first of all, I'll say, doing the memoir slash teacher -y voice was so hard. And I don't think I'll ever do it again. Um, towards the end, I only wanted to, I was, only wanted, I think, okay, my blog posts have all been written in that sort of teachery voice. Um, I don't know about that. Maybe not. I perceive them that Beautiful way. Beautiful lyri lyrical voice. Okay, I don't Possibly know. Possibly teachery, but, but I, ly lyrically teachery. Typically okay. in a memoir, we don't, you don't address you. Yes, that's correct. Right, right. you don't address right. the you. So maybe that's, whatever that voice is, that's what I mean. Um, so, by the end, I was like, I just want to tell stories and not do this reference sure. to the reader. But I think I also like, I, I had, no, I had the benefit of naivete. I had no idea how hard it was going to be to do that. That said, um, I'm glad it feels seamless because it didn't feel seamless to write. At times, I was like, oh, oh, who am I? What am I saying? Um, but by the end, it did. So, so, um, I also knew. I do have this deep love for words and poetry, and I really wanted to um, have the re invite the reader into that part of me and my world. That's why I have poems in there and um, quotes and references, because I survived by reading words and largely poetry. Um, so and, and we survived. By story. Yes. We survive by story. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. So um, however I did that, it was um, just the intention. The fact that it came across is wonderful. But um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think it's David White that says, um, poetry is the language for, what the, for which the ego has no defense. And um, I wanted to write something that felt like that, um, like speaking to you uh, as a as uh, to the to the elevated you, the diamond in the center of your chest, you the you that you have completely forgotten about, the you that that one has numbed, the you that one has numbed, right? right. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I do have a question um, that is sort of a more complicated question, and and I think that um, it, it, when I, I teach memoir, um, and I I teach specifically uh, memoir courses about permission and the issue of um, giving oneself permission to tell one's story in all of its um, truth and beauty and human mess and all of those, all of those things. And that's, um, in the, the years, the few years that I've been teaching, it's the one thing that comes up over and over and over and over again. Who am I to tell my story? Um, and, you know, I, and I, I think especially where women writers and creatives are concerned, uh, who may be navigating the seas of, of addiction in whatever form. 
um, telling our stories uh, can become very complicated. There's a lot of shame involved. Um, no one, and I maintain, no one is ever going to give us permission to tell our stories. We have to give ourselves that, that permission. Um, the book is beautifully written, but is also extraordinarily brave in that you speak openly about your daughter, Alma, um, and the impact of your journey on her and the life that you share together. And I, I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Yes. Um, so the, uh, the reason I open the book with the worst, really, moment of my life with, you know, leaving her in a hotel room was because I wrote this book for anyone who wants to read it, right? But I want to talk especially to the mother who feels like she's a giant piece of shit. And I want to talk to her right away and say, you, like, we're going on this ride right now. Um, because that incident was truly unimaginable and horrific and all of those things. And I don't feel ashamed of it um, anymore. And I don't, um, yeah, I, so again, I think when I started to write and, and talk about my story, I was very nervous because I was not yet divorced. I had people tell me, don't do this because you're not even through your divorce yet. Like this could affect your custody agreement and all kinds of things. And I had family members say, like, why are you doing this so dark? And um, people aren't psyched when you, you, our lives are connected to other people, right? <laughs> There's no way around it. So, um, and, and even having my book be out there has been kind of difficult for my family. But um, as far as Alma's concerned, I, um, I think because it is, like my friend says, there's a special vitriol for mothers who drink. Um, I wanted to talk about, even though it, like I still have nightmares sometimes that because of what I wrote in the book, they're going to arrest me. You know, I still, I'll like, oh my God, could that happen? Like, didn't it, what if the lawyers didn't warn me? You know, I still have those, like, that fear. Um, but I... I wanted to, A, be free myself more than I wanted to do anything else, and B, I wanted to talk to the other mothers that feel that. Um, and I don't think people realize, at least I didn't realize, that that is an actual choice you have to make. Like, I loved reading memoirs. I always have. It did not occur to me until as I start, <laughs> until I started preparing to write my own, like, oh, they have to write about their lives, which include other people. That's a really big deal, you know? Um, so, yeah, and with where, where Alma is concerned, I had someone ask me, you know, like, when will you let her read it? And what what is sort of your um, take on that? And I just, I have, I don't know. I, I don't know. I suspect you will when the time is right. Right. Um, but I don't have a plan. I haven't, you know, I don't... Um, Alma, the reason the she's the best part of everything, you know that has, that has happened, and and my greatest gift from all of this, um, not just because I almost, not just because she's my daughter, she she would be my gift anyway, but because I almost lost her, you know, and that's the most in my face profound reality. All the time, there was a a wonderful. Um Instagram post that you put up uh, the other day um, when the book came out. I think it was your pub day. <laughs> and there's yeah. Alma sitting at, her, at the dining room table. Didn't you know, care at all. Eating her cereal, you know, and I'm like, this child is a Buddha. I'm, <laughs> this kid is like, uh-huh, congratulations, <laughs> mom, you know, like that. Yeah, she um, didn't even know that it was the date, no, which is awesome. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, you could, she's like the wisdom oozing from the child's pores was just <laughs> obvious, I you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think we have time for uh, one more question then, and I think we should turn it over because I'm sure you guys have t lots of questions. Um, one of the most, I think, one of the most profound statements in your book and one that has touched me deeply is 
one stranger who understands your experience exactly will do for you what hundreds of close friends and family who don't understand cannot. It is the necessary palliative for the pain of stretching into change. It is the cool glass of water in hell. And I would love it if you would share a little bit about the inadvertent community that has come together around your work and your words from your earliest blog posts to where we are tonight and moving forward into the future. Wow. Um, uh, I'm glad you said inadvertent because that was never the goal. Um, I, what I said, I posted about this the other day. I had always, I have always turned to words um, for all my answers. And um, those were my cool glasses, you know, of water. The poets and writers and Carolyn Knapp and, um, and when I got, when I got sober or was trying to get sober, I, I realized like, I, I, I had this like visceral need to just talk about, I knew that there was something much bigger though going on than just Laura had a drinking problem and now she's got to get sober. It was like, oh, we are way fucked up about this entire thing. Um, and so that's when Holly and I, you know, soon started talking on home and that's where the thing really started. Um, because I think up until then, you couldn't really hear conversations about sobriety. Um, I mean, it was only 2015, but like podcasts weren't a big deal. And <laughs> there was like, there were maybe a hundred of them or something. No, there's probably more, but there weren't that many. Now there's tons, which is amazing. But I, I mean, I, I went to meetings. I, I couldn't hear the things that I wanted to hear outside of a meeting or a memoir, right? And so it was like, let's talk about this, all of it. And um, and I'm no, I'm, I guess it was not on purpose, but I'm not surprised that a community started to form around that because I think there was a dying need for, for that. I felt it, especially among women. Uh, among women, yeah. yes, especially among women. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's something, and I, I think because um, I have always listened to podcasts. Um, since they've been at you know radio lab and wtf and there's such this it's a weird intimacy that you feel with the people that you're listening to so i think there was something different about that too that formed because we were talking to people every week and they kind of knew our lives and felt they were you know you're, they're in your ears and you can do it in privacy you don't have to even go buy a book that says sobriety on the cover or whatever you can just be wherever you are with with this these voices um, as far as what's developed now, I mean, I just, it feels so, um, I, it's, it's amazing, but it feels so, I can't quite wrap my head around that, you know? And it's growing. I mean, it continues to grow. Your community continues to grow. Yeah. The conversation continues to grow. And I'm going to ask you one final question that every writer hates, but I'm going to ask you oh anyway. Oh boy, Okay. Are you working on? <laughs> oh, I was like, what is the question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, in my mind. In my mind. <laughs> no, I am. I know what it's going to be about. Um, I know what it's going to be about. It'll be a memoir. I have the title, <laughs> which is important That's to big. me. That's yeah. Um, yeah. So I am. Um, well, we all look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that um, there's a there's a mic. So there's a mic. Raise your hand if you want to ask something, and he'll deliver the mic. Oh, right in the front. Oh, okay. oh Is it she, working? Yeah. Testing. Working. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Hi. It's Elizabeth von oh. Bright. Hi. <laughs> um, I was just talking to. What's your name? Megan. Megan. <laughs> we were just talking about the whole Instagram thing and how, finding you on Instagram and the strength and all that. This is totally an odd thing to talk about, but for me at least, but I just want to ask you about crying <laughs> in general. I find, I'm sober, been for a while, I find myself like I can cry 
Like when you started reading, I could cry. I could cry when you started talking about how much you liked her, cry. Like what, <laughs> w does that ever stop? Like does no, that- No, why would you ever want it to stop? No, because I guess for so many years I cried for all the wrong reasons. Like crying because yeah. I felt sorry for myself or crying because of shame or crying. And this is the real crying, but it's sometimes hard to navigate the world because you're sitting with people and they, they're nowhere near <laughs> tears. And you're kind of, Am I wrong? Is it we? No, it, you're not wrong. Um, I can wish, people relate to? Can you guys relate yes. to this? I don't cry. I yes. I love when I cry because okay. I have a hard I need to harder get more time comfortable crying. with it. And it's and tear. I mean, I think Glennon said um, someone asked her <laughs> once why she cries so much, and she said same reason I laugh so much because I'm paying attention. Okay. Like how can you not cry? Yeah. If you're okay, okay. Because you're you're so used to in when you've grown up in your an addict and maybe people in your family are, but they are so not even ever going to get there. It's in there though. Yes. You know, like all the, but the fact you're that you're lucky like, cause you don't, you don't have to pretend anymore. You're like, yeah. I've already been to hell. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm just going to cry when I feel like it. But I think we're, as a, as a world and a community, it's always like, Oh, you can't feel that way. You're not allowed to be that way. You're not allowed to. And I think it's so nice that you've opened up this sort of dialogue <laughs> that, you can be, you can... I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm like, we're a crying community. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we've created. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just, I just have to say that um, I grew up in a crying household. And um, we, we used to say that my, my father used to cry at supermarket openings. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, right. I mean, you know, the television commercials, delivering refrigerators, bad. You know, oh. it's, it's very bad. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's awesome. Hi. I was hoping you could talk a little bit, if you're willing to, about how you plan to talk to Alma about drinking. So from a mother, a sober mother with three kids, it's, um, it's something that I struggle with because I don't share an opinion that they're getting from the rest of society. And sometimes I worry of becoming in too, too strict or, you know, it's just seems like such a, a fine line. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So for most of my answer is, I don't know, <laughs> but I know a couple things. Um, I do counter when, when something comes up and she expresses her, uh, the view that she's absorbed about alcohol. For example, um, she will say, like we were riding in the car once and she saw someone smoking in the car. And there were kids in the back and she said, that's so terrible, mom. They're, they can't, um, the poor kids have to be with that smoking. I'm like, I know, that is, that's, that's bad. And she said, but they must just be addicted. I'm like, yeah, they maybe. Um, I said, but you know, honey, um, how did she phrase it? She said, oh, did you know that our cousins are trying to quit to quit smoking? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And I said, you know, people get addicted to all kinds of things. And I said, I had to quit drinking. And that was really, really bad, too. She's like, but it's not as bad as smoking. And I was like, well, no, let's talk about that. <laughs> right? So little things will come up like that. Or you just, you just don't drink because you had a problem. It's like... Yes, and alcohol is not good for anybody. So, but she, no one, you know, that's like the first time she's hearing these things. So I had a friend who gave me the best parenting advice ever. And she said, only answer the question asked, um, which is like, I've never read a single parenting book. That is my parenting book. <laughs> but it's really good because when, any of us who have kids know when you try to jam stuff down, they're like, boop, not, I'm out. But when they, when they know that there's, she, they're watching us and listening all the time. She hears me talk about sobriety all the time. She sees me not drink all the time. She sees, she, she watches and listens and she has been for years. So she's absorbing a lot. And once in a while she'll ask me a question. What was it like when you got drunk? What was it like when you drank? I will always answer the question she asks, but I try not to push the ones that she doesn't. Now I'm also in this little golden window. She's going to be 11. She's not a teenager yet. Um, and she says, I'm not going to drink. I want to be like my mom. Um, I'm going to be straight with her. Like I, I won't jam it down her throat, but I'm, 
gonna be straight with her about what alcohol was really like. And I'm gonna tell her what it, what it did to me. And I'm going to um, answer the questions that are asked and interject when I hear something wrong, you know? She'll say, Diet Coke is terrible. I'm like, well, yeah, there's lots of things that are bad for you. Um, I'll say, wine was bad. Wine is bad. She's like, only for you, though. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Wine's bad for everybody, <laughs> you know? So <clears throat> you get little moments. They're watching. I think anything that you can talk to her about is pales in compa comparison to how you are, right? So you're, how you're, you are with your kids, so. No, you're good. Oh, I got a baton. I get one? No. Oh, that's okay. oh, we could do a baton. Here. Here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, first off, I'm on my second book already. I've marked up the first one <laughs> in the first few weeks of the month. Um, but I would love to hear you talk a little bit about in the, the chapter, The Truth About Lying. So candidly, I first got to that chapter. I'm like, oh, this has nothing to do with me because that's not something that I have I'm to worry about. Right. Yeah. And then when I got to the part where you start talking about approval seeking and, you know, not sharing your opinion and you talk about it as being dishonesty marked as something sweeter and more socially acceptable. I was like, oh, OK, so maybe this does apply to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then you went on to talk a little bit about all of your different relationships in life, whether friendships as a kid or mm -hmm. or when you're dating someone and really just from the beginning, hiding a part of who you were to try to make them happy. So I would love to hear a little bit more about that process that you went through and understanding that and kind of how you tackle that now. Do you still find yourself starting to be a little bit of playing that role? <laughs> and Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, I thought it went off. Um, yeah, that's a, that, that part has been a shocker to a lot of people because I don't think most of us walk around think, thinking that we're liars because we're not outright deceiving people, you know, maliciously. Um, <clears throat> I started lying very young to, to keep peace in my home, right? And I think a lot of us learn to do that as children to survive our environments. It's an intelligent thing to do. Um, if I just, I'm not sad, I, everything's fine. You know, those are little ways we learn to lie, shape shift to make things okay. And then we carry that through into adult, our adult lives and um, don't even really see it as lying. Um, what revealed it to me was going through the steps and um, <laughs> looking at the, re the re relationships where I had had difficulty and having someone else point out to me, that's dishonesty. It was like, what? <laughs> oh my God. Um, because I felt like, but I have to do that. I have to do that because I'm trying to like, if I'm going to be in relationship with this person, I have to make it easier. It's hard. You know, they're, they're, they're the problem. Like, they're difficult people. And I'm just responding to that. Not so much, right? Um, so, one, just seeing that is huge. And then, two, um, so much of the dishonesty comes from not having a sense of your own self and not much self-worth, right? And when we're drinking, we, I mean, I lie, I outright lied too when I was drinking because I was terrified all the time. I had to protect this thing. Um, but I also lied in that way of just like little stories here and little stories there. And I also, like when, we, when you're in active addiction, you have no sense of self. You, your self is buried way underneath there and you are you are this um addiction this behavior right um so it takes time to just reveal as my sponsor says reveal yourself to yourself it takes time um and that's done just through uh, all kinds of inquiry personal inquiry and this type of work, reading things like this, working with a sponsor or working with a therapist, where with someone who can see your blind spots, right? And um, and getting to know yourself. Like, what am I up to when I do that? What am I up to when I just lied to my friend because I wanted to avoid a thing or I wanted to connect with her on something that, 
you know, what what am I up to when I do that? So like approaching it with curiosity instead of like, oh, you're such a piece of shit. Um, a big thing for me was keeping people in my life that I didn't really, like, that I had a lot of hostility and anger towards because, uh, well, because of my father. <laughs> but um, that dynamic and just feeling so stuck in that, right? And it's like, no, you're the problem. You, were, you lied from day one because you said that's okay with me, you know? Um, and just understanding it all comes from this, like, very intelligent, kind, sweet place inside of you that was just trying to survive. And now you have the wherewithal and capacity and tools to start dealing with it. Um, but yes, I still, of course, still will go, why did, why did I just say that? <laughs> you know, oh my God, I just lied. Um, but it doesn't happen much as, as often. And I don't have wide, vast differences of how I, um, who I am in the world. Right, there's basically one version. So, mm -hmm. we got time for a couple more questions. Sorry, giving it my all. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, so be careful about the speaker here. I'm gonna try and okay. Okay, thanks. Hi, Laura um, and Furman. It's <laughs> hi. Um, it's such an honor to be here and see you in person. Um, and I don't even know if I have a formulated question yet. Um, but I, I feel like there's so much I want to say to you. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, I found you one night when I was questioning my drinking, sitting at the computer with a bottle of Prosecco and trying to figure out what I'm going to do about this. And that's when I stumbled across home and you. And um, I was drawn to you from the, the very, from hello. <laughs> and um, there's just something so, um, so there, you just have no affect. You just are who you are. And you're so generous and brave and amazing. And I think that's why so many people are drawn to you. And I think you're somewhat of a phenom um, because you, you went through this crazy addiction and landed here because I, I used to listen to you on home and with Meadow all the time and talking about um, how you really wanted to write this book and you thought you were never going to get this book out and that you wanted this bigger life. And I, I really relate to that. I don't know what my bigger life is yet, but so are you feeling, are you, feel, like, are you taking it in? Do you feel like it's a bigger life? And um, also, um, I love how Megan refers to your writing as lyrical, because I listen to you, um, and it, it, I find it difficult uh, to listen to authors read their book, but it, uh, you did not disappoint. You were just you, and it reminded me of like listening to a movie when somebody's narrating the movie in the background, but very, but not a distraction. It was just, it was so amazingly well read. So, um, uh, so I'm just wondering, like, yeah. are you? How is this feeling t for you right now in terms mm -hmm. of your bigger life? Um, <clears throat> thank you for all your kind words. We've corresponded a lot on emails and such over the years. Um, I am doing my very best to take it all in. I mean, overall, yes. I feel it, I um, am I, uh, beside myself all the time, truly. Um, before the book came out, all of that, uh, my life, I, I can't believe it. Um, I can believe it and I can't believe it. It's beautiful and messy and glorious and I feel so lucky and um, my friend says, how, do, how lucky and deserving are we? <laughs> And I like that, because you don't want to leave out the part where you worked your ass off. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I am trying to take it all in, and like, I, I will process this like tomorrow, you know? <laughs> like right now, I'm like, oh, faces, wow, <laughs> Melissa, oh my god. <laughs> but uh, tomorrow, I'll be like, god damn, that was amazing. Um, I, try, I try really hard to be, to, I promised myself, because leading up to publishing this book was the most, like the two weeks right before I was <laughs> blowing up Alyssa's phone, 
it was the most anxiety I had felt since drinking, like just cold fear. And, um, and I, I was pissed because I was like, if I feel like this, I'm going to miss it all, you know, and it passed. And, um, I just, I, my, my sort of promise to myself is like, don't you dare miss, miss this. Don't you dare miss it. Not a second. So. Any final question? Final question. Could be from Alyssa as well. Oh. Who was it? Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> this may be inappropriate, but are you still friends with Meadow and um, the, uh, the other person that you did the home podcast with? Holly, Holly yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so why did those stop? Um, the short answer is sometimes things are like when you're, they have to end. Things have to end, right? Um, if you're wondering about the relationship side of that, I will never answer that because it's like asking someone why they got divorced or something like that. It's just, um, I love Holly. I adore her and support her work. Meadow and I are still also great friends. Um, things end. Right, we did it until we. It was time for it to not be happening anymore. Future podcasts? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's always a possibility. I love. I love doing them, um, but it's a. It's a lot of work, and I want. I would. I think at this point, I would rather put that into writing. So. Thank you so much, Alyssa and Laura, for having this conversation with us tonight. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Uh, as mentioned earlier, we are going to transition into the signing, but if everyone wouldn't mind remaining seated for just two to three minutes while I get this set up. Um,